Alex Hanser here. I'm out hiking on a beautiful, sunny Saturday afternoon here in southern Colorado. So I want to talk with you about screen addiction. And that's a much bigger picture than internet addiction or social media addiction. Because screen addiction goes the whole gamut from gaming to obsessing on notifications of various kinds to the various forms of social media, which includes YouTube to various forms of uh, binge watching. And I view the addictive use of YouTube as similar to the addictive use of a television set. I find it to be uh, ironic uh, that people think that they've uh, turned off their TV only to become uh, addicted to moving images. See, from my perspective, there's a number of different things that are striking a chord with me. Now, like others, and I'm going to be sharing some lectures, this is going to be a really long video because the quality of the information shared should be reshared. These are different perspectives. One person is talking about the dangers of, um, of becoming addicted to YouTube and all that goes on on YouTube. Another is just simply talking about screen addiction and the various forms of that. Another seems to focus primarily on social media addiction, Facebook, things of that nature. So obviously there's a number of different things that are coming together at once. And it's not a matter of blaming anything. It's a matter of understanding the drug-like effects of too much of a certain thing that's a good thing uh, in the right percentage used appropriately, but when it's misused, when it's abused, there are harmful consequences of which society is only beginning to question. And I'm a guy that questions a lot of things. I've always known about the dangers of screen addiction, but it's easy for us to just look at those people with the iPhones. But see, I'm all about self-honesty and I can see my own addiction and notifications through my laptop as being of the same thing, even though it's not a iPhone and it may not be the same hardware that I think is uniquely harmful, the iPhone. But that doesn't mean that the laptop isn't damaging the brain as the brain becomes addicted to the dopamine experience through seeing likes and notifications and shares of uh, online digital content. And it's not that it doesn't have value. It's that it's all about the right amount. You know, I didn't know that if you put too much oil, that you can actually uh, blow up an engine. And I had to pull off the road last year. Now, had I uh, properly put in the right amount, I wouldn't have had to pull off the road. You know, but I knew something was wrong. There was a lot of smoke that was coming out the rear end. And then I was told later, yeah, it was a good thing you pulled over and got some help getting that drained. Otherwise, you could have blown out your engine. So I was lucky. But we know what the, uh, the opposite effect is, right? If you're not going to put any oil in it. Well, let's use the, uh, the internet as a comparison. You know, the internet is a lot of information that can help educate us. And I benefit greatly, leaps and bounds from the podcasts, I turn them into podcasts. I turn the videos into podcasts at onlinevideoconverter.com. So I find videos in which I'm going to like the lecture and I'll go to YouTube. And the way that I will use YouTube is I will look for a lecture. I will usually go to filter and I will usually click longer than 20 minutes. Um, you know, regardless of the fact that this is somewhat of an ADHD society and, and it, it's recommended that videos actually in some cases be shorter on YouTube for the limited attention span. That's fine. As for myself, if there's a subject that I'm really, really interested in, a self-help lecture, uh, something regarding motivation, things of that nature, hell, <laughs> give me as much as you got. You got a full hour? I'll listen to the hour. I'm not, I don't need a six minute <laughs> improve your life type of a rant because I'm so busy. I'm on the go. You know, just give it to me in five minutes. Like that's just, I, I don't even know where to go with that right now. All I can tell you <laughs> is that there's a number of amazing lectures that can be instantly converted to an MP3 within a minute that you can find literally within 30 seconds. And one of the ways uh, to determine whether something is, um, well, after you, uh, if you're going to look for something longer like me, 
sometimes uh, the amount of views, sometimes you can get a, a feeling for the thumbnail, uh, sometimes you can get a feeling in the first few um, minutes or, or even as fast as hearing the man or woman speak, like the first few words out of their mouth, you'll get the type of resonance. Yeah, okay, I'm going to listen to this person. This person feels like they're speaking with a truth resonance. Other people, you know, there may be something off right away that has you, uh, <laughs> it may be something that's visually going on. It, it may be just a vibe that you get immediately. Uh, and then you find yourself clicking to the back button. And that may not necessarily mean whether or not that person is telling the truth, but whether or not you resonate with them. So on and so forth. And whether or not some people um, resonate, resonate with me. And a lot of people don't. Uh, the thing is, it's one thing to output information onto the internet, writing, podcasts, videos, artwork, other things not expressed, and uh, that's a healthy contribution uh, to that to the collective hive mind consciousness because it is what it is, and the internet is expressing that. It's the sharing of ideas. It's not all bad. It's just understanding in the right amount. You know, we can we can get into a we can get into comparisons here with cooking. You know, but I don't have any real specifics to get into off the top of my head you know today I uh, went hiking I've hiked up uh, probably a mile or two uphill and so I'm looking down at where I parked and I'm a few miles uh, downhill to talk about my own addiction to the screen reality is kind of to, to shift gears here I can kind of give you a little bit I think this is going to take me some time to process and uh, the longer we're away from a certain something that's become addictive, that's when we'll see the results of the healing process. Some people recommend a cold turkey. You know, it's interesting because I've complained, others have complained about our own reach being rendered uh, fairly invisible or to nothing when we post on Facebook, whereas we may have reached a great deal more people years ago. There's also been a great divide over politics. So a lot of us have blocked and uh, defriended each other over the years. So that, you know, that makes sense as well. You know, this, this, this divide, the split in consciousness in this fallen consciousness paradigm world matrix makes sense. But there's also the tampering with the, the algorithms and the censorship that limits our reach. And what I've seen between myself and Facebook is startling myself and my other contacts on Facebook, how, how limited. And, uh, and then we get used to it. Oh, now we're in this, uh, Orwellian reality. So what should we do? Should we just no longer create content, no longer the incentive and all this heat on YouTube? I think it's, uh, better to actually step back and recenter on where it is that we apply our energy, not to stop doing what we're doing. But I've been an advocate the whole time of the real meetup of, of real communities. I don't necessarily see myself as an example of that, but a proponent of that, a proponent of people um, from different walks of life, um, having community without it necessarily being the rainbow family gathering and all that that entails. A lot of people that are there just for the party, you know, but I'm only one person. I'd like to see a future America that is more of that stuff going on, you know, a place like, uh, Places where maybe uh, I can go travel within this country. Places to stop. You know, going to a place like Slob City or going to something like that or, or, the, or, or, or the, the Mesa over in Taos. Those are rough places in some cases and very rough people. And someone has to be psychologically prepped to live amongst um, off-grid society folk. As for myself... My social media addiction only increased by going off grid because it was there to be a void and be a place where I can reach out to others where I can't reach out locally. You know, the idea of, of being able to share a message with, and I, I don't want to let that go. I don't want to let that go. I plan to keep uploading videos. I'm talking about the addictive overconsumption, the binge watching of, of YouTube entertainment videos, not so much cat videos, but just the overall internet experience of being at the edge of our chair. And for a guy like me that is, um, have been talking about, has been talking about World War III, and we're looking at things on the horizon, 
I'll say to you now, it takes a certain amount of discipline or growth to be so adamant about that and staying on top of it, but to also step away from the internet and go, you know what? If something happens, it happens. Um, what I was going to say about the Facebook limited reach in the way that this is not a bad thing, it helps us wean off that addictive uh, dopamine rush from, uh, from uh, people responding to our content. You can even say that people like myself and others have been in a state of withdrawal from having a limited reach either on YouTube or Twitter or Facebook. It's it, it screwed up. I don't want to curse here, but I, I really would like to curse right now. It's effed up. But you know what? Looking at things from a cosmic, spiritual, non-victim perspective, mm, seems to me things are right where they should be. And this is right around the time because I looked at my life going off the grid from the internet years ago. The thing is, how do I make money if I completely go off the internet, if I'm no longer making videos? You know, if people aren't contributing once in a while to the things that I do, you know, and right now I, I do have some actual goals. I would like to be hired and there's going to be some efforts made in May. You know, because when we talk about pulling yourself away from the screen, you know, you don't just partially pull yourself away. You know, oh, I'm going to pull myself away from social media, but I'm going to binge watch DVDs. Or, oh, I'm going to pull myself away from social media. I do act on my Facebook page, but I'm going to watch like four movies in a row. You know, like it, it was fun, you know, uh, treating the internet like a drug in the last few days. But today is like one of those days where I'm like, you know what? Uh, yeah. The lectures that I listened to last night that I'm going to share with you in a separate video hit me and hit me hard. And I thought about how it relates to, you know, the concept of being all that you can be. And so I can look at how the internet has benefited me in sharing my stuff, but it's also, it, it, it creates a little place where we escape to where the real world uh, becomes a knuckly place, an unfun place. And there's a reason why over the last year I've been putting more of an emphasis on journaling, writing by hand. And I wasn't even necessarily connecting that with screen addiction. I was connecting that with spirituality, just being old school. And something about using a greater percentage of your brain because when you write by hand, you use more parts of your brain. And it helps with memory and things like that. And, and it seems that over the years, I've been slowly studying, but not really putting together the whole, like it isn't really until now is what I'm saying to you, that I really see the harm that it can even do to some of us that are content creators. People that basically live on the internet, putting information out, but they're basically looking at the monitor all day long. And up until last year, I had a part-time job posting news for someone's website. And even though that was some additional income, I knew that it was, um, it was my destiny to move on from that, from, from, from being so responsive even and aware of all of the current news and developments. And again, for someone that is seeing something on the horizon, it takes another part of myself, a stronger spiritual part of myself to step away from having daily access to the news and living somewhere to where, you know, unless it's something really, really big, I don't expect to get any visitors because I never have any visitors. You know, like, hey, and I, I can imagine somebody coming over I haven't seen in a year. Alex, have you heard they just hit New York or, or something to that effect? We're at war with Russia or something to that effect. Or, you know, do you hear what China just declared and or, or something to that effect? And there's other things that maybe I can worry about, like, well, then how would I be able to uh, talk with certain people on the Internet about maybe rallying uh, uh, some folks together and maybe a little, you know, de facto survival camp thing, you know, like something out of Red Dawn. No. And I think there's a part of me that's letting go. It's like, yes, I can prepare and 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 let a part of my mind, I guess, for a number of years, um, Allow a little space to be rented out that's focused on this potential event. But there can also be a part of me that's more spiritual than that or than someone that's afraid or than someone that's going to be addicted to the newswire or constantly looking for signs of things going to the next level. As far as I'm concerned, at some point we're going to be at that level. But it to be really ultimately prepared for that, we have to be of sound mind. How are we going to be of sound mind if we're addicted to social media? How are we going to be of sound mind if we're addicted to video games? And, you know, there's not a lot of things that I agree with my mom about or ways that she, um, I'm taking a look around here just for a second here in this, uh, 
National Forest Land. Uh, her style of parenting. I didn't agree with a lot of things, but you know what? Some things do happen for a reason. And she did not <laughs> support the idea of me having a gaming system and becoming a gaming zombie. And this was like the 1980s. And we don't even ha share a lot of the same views on a lot of things. So I wonder if that was a reason. We're done for a reason. There may be things that I didn't agree with or things that I didn't like, but maybe some things happened for a reason. That I wasn't around certain things. That I wasn't around certain people. That I was sheltered to a certain degree. That there was such a thing as limits on how much TV I actually watched. There was actually a limit to how much BS I actually took in in the 1980s. Is that a bad thing? Is that a bad thing? That my mother prevented me from becoming a video game junkie in the 1980s? No, it wasn't a bad thing. And I had those periods in which I binge-watched television over at my uh, dad's house. And there were times where I saw stuff that I would consider to be a little bit traumatic of, of a various number of, uh, of, of things. With the video game culture, you know, what it would be like to uh, visit the arcades when I had the ability to. Either the nickel ones or the ones where you had to put a quarter in. But because those deep early life... Um, brain development uh, stages uh, were not matched with video game addiction somehow uh, I made it through the PlayStation uh, Xbox phase and I guess we're still in that or maybe new systems but it's like um, I think about that you know there was an emphasis early on in my life as early as six years old on reading I remember I was in the first grade and there was like some letter from the governor and they were just mass producing these like, thank you for being enrolled in the first grade summer reading program. I'm the governor. Here's my signature. And I had like one of those little gold stars. And that's, that's a, something that stands out in my lifetime as an early life accomplishment. I've also talked to you about uh, some ridiculous thing that got me sent to detention. This is back in Aurora, North Marion uh, Elementary School. And I'm sitting there in detention and I open up the book and I'm looking for the name of a superhero, you know, and, and TV's banned at home. And, you know, I'm, I'm looking for other creative outlets and I'm looking for the name of a superhero and I find the name Insusceptible. And you know, I wrote a few, uh, drew a few comic panels, never got deep into drawing or being really all that good at it. But uh, there was something about the early 90s and uh, the comic book uh, archetype of the hero Symbolism that struck a chord with me growing up, going from a uh, little boy to young adult type of a thing, reality and purpose in living. And what would a superpower have? The insusceptible. And so we're talking about someone that can't be hypnotized, can't be put under the spell. <laughs> Just like I was writing that journal multiple times in 2014, many people are under the spell. <laughs> and here is a young Alex Ansari, probably 11 years old. I can't guess the exact age, maybe maybe 12 but out of a dictionary, basically like uh, nine inches thick. Think about that. Nine inches thick. That's, that's insane. Okay, maybe six. Six or seven. That's a big dictionary. And so out of that whole book, my finger finds the insusceptible. Not able to be easily influenced. And, and, and my, my uh, podcasts and videos will be misunderstood by many people because I come from an independent position that they confuse for mainstream. Or vice versa, that someone might confuse for extreme radical or extremism or something to that effect. And they're still not recognizing it for my own information that I'm uh, sharing freely. But there, there's periods in which multiple people might be tapping into the same truth at the same time. It's like the hundredth monkey. And we may not get it till we start to see our peers get it. And then we started to become more comfortable speaking about something and it's less fringe. And uh, it is definitely less fringe to speak about something called the digital detox or screen addiction and uh, what it's doing to people. Now, it's limited with how far they take it. Where most people aren't able to take it is how these portals to hell as one YouTuber called it. And that's why there's going to be a multi-hour, almost marathon uh, video compilation that I'm going to be sharing on my channel for you to listen to. And again, my internet's going to be cut in about two days. And I'm doing this because I need to step back. Plus, economically, things are very challenging. 
and I still need to be able to put gas in the car and I still need to be able to buy things with cash to eat. There are things that I need to buy. There is propane, things of that nature. So I'm actually uh, of the mindset that sometimes we might reach some economic challenges because we need to recenter on something or get closer to the earth. You know, every time that I've had some issues technically with uh, my car, I've seen it as for a reason. And there's been like, you know, some sincere effort put into the, the prayers for my car to not have the issues that I had before, to be frank with you. Because I'm going to need that car to go to the library to upload videos for you. And the idea in stepping back from the digital addiction is to be able to, from a personal goal perspective, create more content. But what would your goal be? If you're not a content creator, what is it that's missing in your life? If there's something there that's taking up a lot of time. Maybe this, this video will reach someone like a gaming addict or someone that is realizing that maybe they have a problem because they're, they're hearing more about society talk about it and it's not so fringe. It's not so cool anymore. For people to be tuned in, contacted, wherever they are on the planet, to not have that type of natural boundary and barrier. And you know, it is magical, right, that I have the ability to come to you from where I am in Colorado. This is fairly new technology and things like YouTube, but a little goes a long way. So yes, we have technology that our ancestors did not have, like satellites, although the the flat earthers say there are no satellites, so I'm sure they have another theory for where I'm getting my internet from. But we don't need to change topics. <sighs> but see, that's amazing. But I need to become more disciplined with such a powerful, powerful thing. Because such a powerful, powerful thing can literally lead to like overdose-like effects to where we're dumbed down and we're less passionate and we're less creative. And it's like, I look at my earlier videos where I'm talking about staring into the false light and people with their obsessions on the cell phone. And I was talking about these things before they became cool. And now there are more and more professionals that are seeing the effect on social media, on themselves, on others, on the world. And particularly people are very alarmed by the, uh, the behavior of the younger children and how short their attention span is. And people that were young really not too long ago are talking about the young people like they're no longer young. <laughs> it's like I'm still somewhat young or am seen as young, yet I'm 38. There's actually a generation that has cell phones that's like 12 years old, 10 years old. And if I was their parent, uh, if I was their father, uh, I would not be in support of them having a cell phone. And I think that it's sad that people feel that everyone should have a cell phone in order to feel safe. Um, it is a reality, so I'm not here to blame anyone. I can understand it. I can understand it. But yet, there are deeper reasons why society is becoming less safe. And uh, a society where everybody has a cell phone isn't necessarily a safer society. Just like a society where... Uh, we have a surveillance society or surveillance cameras, a panopticon dystopia, cameras everywhere, tracking, tracing, things of that nature, face scanning. But does it really stop the sexual assaults? Does it really stop the gang violence? And as we can see in the UK, no, but it spurs other things like here, turn in your knife day. Yeah, the surveillance cameras didn't really work out very well, well, nor the shouting children saying, you are being watched by say, say, tay, they. I remember actually reporting on stuff like that. But see, now that I understand the dark side of some of the uh, individuals like Alex Jones and those that follow him with their content creation in the uh, co-opted alternative media, becoming addicted to certain voices, certain personalities, it becomes clear to me it's like crystallizing in my mind how this can lead to full-blown possessions. When people are possessed or taken by an evil spirit and uh, they're playing a, a powerful role. And I've thought about things like this for over 10 years, by the way. Certain people on the air, I'm not going to get into names. One person back in Portland. And the idea, the intuition that I had was that there are multiple spirits speaking through one particular deceiver 
who was syndicated at one point around the nation. And looking at the level of disinfo and fear mongering about common Ellening back in 2011 and, and saying that, you know, we're going to go beyond time in 2012 and just a lot of things that came and went. I had the feeling that he was almost way too intelligent to not know that that was uh, BS and that there almost seemed to be a number of deceiving spirits working within him to deceive people on the uh, airwaves. And being a radio guy, we're not necessarily talking about the flat screen mind control. We're talking about media mind control and literally the idea of being hypnotized by someone's voice. So let me try to wrap things up. We talk about the digital detox. It's one thing to listen to some music or watch some videos. A little goes a long way. Some healthy tips that I remember hearing in some of the lectures and I'm going to be putting together compilations so you hear what I heard and can understand its impact and maybe it can impact you as well. Because I'm thinking about how can this help me improve the quality of the videos that I present to you by stepping back from my own addictions and setting a good example. Not just pointing my finger at cell phone users, but taking accountability for being a laptop user and being now the type of guy that will go out hiking for multiple hours, that will read for multiple hours, that will write for multiple hours without checking notifications on social media. The first step for me is cutting the internet and then doing uploads, and then finding uh, other forms to uh, boost my batteries, if you will, uh, to find inspiration. You know, so it's a matter of uh, what we watch. What also made sense is, you know, for what we watch to be entertaining. Maybe with a formula, a little bit of entertaining, uh, rather, excuse me, educational, not dumbed down entertainment. But a good formula would be a mix of both. Something that's educational with maybe a little bit of entertainment. But the idea of limited screen time to about two hours. So you take a guy like me that uh, watches a fair amount of videos, but also video editing. But yet I only reach so many people on the internet and sometimes I put more work into certain things or videos than there needs to be. In some cases, there should be a little bit more work. So finding a little bit more balance and effective workflow, but minimizing overall screen time and increasing the amount of time spent doing other things. It's about balance. So I'm gonna end this podcast now. I'm gonna continue with my thoughts now that I'm walking down the hill. I was previously at the top of the hill and sometimes I'll be getting into a podcast and people are working their way up the hill thinking, oh, I hear somebody talking up there. <laughs> I don't wanna interrupt them. So I've had a number of those experiences. So I see value in being silent in nature, but also like recording these podcasts out in nature with an audio recorder like this. And I really like this white one that I've been using for some of the videos that you've seen <clears throat> because it also works as a player. So as recently as last night, for example, I fell asleep listening to a number of lectures. The cool thing about that, <laughs> I haven't even scratched the surface of and really done any self-experimentation on it, but there are some legitimate self-hypnosis files that are out there. I do believe that. And that you can reprogram yourself with positive affirmations. You know, and you, you think about a world where people fall asleep to uh, the television set. I know my grandmother and grandfather did that. And uh, a lot of people are sleepwalking through reality thinking that they're, they're awake on the internet. So I want to talk about my experiences a little bit but it's always been like a way to deal with loneliness, but this isn't a new thing. You know, I can take it to a, to an extreme in certain circumstances, but you know, in some cases it's therapeutic to be able to get on the internet and get on Facebook. Like when I was uh, without a home in Portland, just to be able to sit down somewhere and rest and work on something on the computer. And for a while I had an online job and it seemed like that was meant to be because it gave me something to do from February, 2015 on for a number of hours per day and, and it was uh, just picking things on my own uh, you know whatever I wanted to pick basically uh, that just dealt with independent news and just posting to the site instead of having someone breathe down my neck and say what to post and it was short lived but uh, that was a positive experience but now it's several years later and the world's become a lot more intense and I'm a little less interested in seeing what's on the news wire I'm a little less interested. 
uh, with a news job or a job that revolves around being in front of the screen. In fact, the media that I produce, I don't want to spend a lot of time in front of the screen producing it, but I want things to improve. I want there to be a sense of efficiency when I'm editing. So thinking about things like that. But as long as I'm only going to have so many viewers, really, I'm not going to break my back. I, you know, I, I'm not going to break my back. No way. No way. Yeah. As far as I'm concerned, at any moment, anything can happen. So we should be just living as if we've already arrived. You know, I, I, I placed a lot of expectations that I've never been able to fulfill. And I haven't necessarily lived up to other people's expectations, whether it be what I cover or, you know, whether or not I do enough videos with myself on the video. And what's this image? What's this? It's just not enough. And the fact of the matter is, with people in a internet consumption mindset, it's never good enough. It's never enough. And people that we connect with on the internet... They either are our real friends or they're people on the internet. And at some point, we have to be able to be accountable enough for those of us that are on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. Because, yes, it's easy for us to look down at the gamers, at the people in the Sim Cities, right? But are our own conflicts and conversations also a part of a simulation where it's all taking place in cyberspace? And I've been giving this a lot more time, so I see value in the internet, but only in certain doses. Nature is what's been missing. And um, I'm the kind of person that I'll volunteer, maybe I'll, I'll look at what woofing organizations are in Colorado, to get out and about and maybe uh, work on some of my own social skills to where politics and, and philosophies about archons are, are just not shared with others. And they're just more of an effort on my part for us to come to a common ground on something. But if that's going to be the case, then I shouldn't be discussing my YouTube channel at all. <laughs> you know, and, and, and practicing, I guess, being a traveling man. There's a part of me that wants to do that. That doesn't want to be on the internet at all. That just wants to be a traveling guy and have certain experiences. But I do want to share about my experiences. Well, one of the ways that I've been able to curb... The overuse of Facebook was by writing more. And I noticed when I started to write more, my health went up. Other areas of my health went up. It seemed that all those, a number of things were interconnected. And I found myself not smoking for a number of uh, weeks now. And it's been <clears throat> an improvement. This I'm actually walking down from a hill. I've only walked up this hill three times since I've lived in this area. To this, uh, it, it's, it's like a, a lookout point. You know, somewhere where there's a high elevation and just look down at everything. <sighs> I'm just so grateful to be here, you know. I'm within um, 10 miles of where I live, maybe 20. doesn't really matter. It's close enough. If I was in uh, Portland, Oregon, I'd have to drive all the way out to Central Oregon to, to get a, a view like this. So I'm like, what am I missing? And we only live once. And it's like, yes, right now, YouTube... Although it's, it's not what it was, and it's not what it really should be. Hovering now at 170-something. I was just reporting to you 190-something not too long ago. It's still going down. It's not done going down yet. That's scary. I don't like that. And so it almost feels like we're being abused by the machine. You know, not to sound like I'm crying or anything, because I'm not. You know, you can actually almost call it a joke. It's like we're being abused by a robot. You know, but it, there's a little bit of robot abuse here. Bot abuse. Spot attack. <laughs> Your video has been demonetized. Your video has been buried by the algorithm. And it's like, whoa, dude, what did I do to you? And then you look around and you see it's happening to a lot of people. Some people want to get political with it. And maybe even suggest that I'm doing great or something with my 77 views after 14 years of having a YouTube channel. Surely you would think people would just hang around for a few years and be a part of that sub niche. Instead of just keep moving along, just keep moving along. But see, a lot of people just wait for the machine to tell them when Alex Ansari uploaded a video. There's probably only so many that are going, gee, I wonder what Alex Ansari uh, uploaded today. Here, I'll go to youtube.com slash A-L-E-X-A-N-S-A-R-Y, press the enter key. Repeat, repeat. And do this on a regular basis. Because unless you do that, 
or go to alexhansry.tv and I'll let you know when that website's going to be uh, all updated. But see, that's another offshoot of my own addiction to things online that waste my time. It's taken me away from the online time that should have been spent on blogs, on articles, on posting my videos to my own website, and it just becomes boring. But why? Because we don't see enough people going to our website and we were given the candy. Oh, people will respond over here. Just keep it on Facebook. You know, 15 people respond to your little status update. Oh, your video? Forget it. Nobody will even see it. And it's like, after a while, it becomes an abusive situation. So no, we don't necessarily have to abandon Facebook entirely or YouTube or Twitter. But sometimes we're working harder, not smarter. And sometimes we can almost be infected by the internet to where the quality of what we put out is less because we're not seeing that type of return. What's that, 77 views? Are you kidding me? This is a joke? Now I'm supposed to break my back on this for 77 views? And the, you know that, that, that says a number of things about a number of uh, areas, to keep it brief. What I will say is how we share our experience and our truth as people live today covers the gamut from writing by hand to freestyle writing to different forms of journalism to video to podcasting to art. We're not limited. We're not limited. So we shouldn't be creating less content. We should create creating more, but to be keeping quality in mind, you know, and for the things that we create, at least speaking for myself, things that will test, stand the test of time, things that will be valuable in five years and 10 years. You know, I, I look at like new shows where I'd be covering a bunch of stuff, you know, uh, back in Portland, I'd be covering a bunch of stuff that I'm reading off of Infowars.com or reading off of blacklistednews.com or pulling from rents.com. Just, you know, the, the mo- you know, not necessarily the most extreme stories, but everything that fit into the narrative that everything was about the pop. You know, and we're going all the way back to my shows in 2008. What, what, where does that take somebody? Where does that take somebody in life? Putting yourself out there 24-7, reporting, 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 doing the poor man reporting thing, living on the internet, breathing, also being hated for it, for not getting in line politically, for being an independent. Where does a life like that go? I'm not really sure. I'm not really sure. But what I do know, right, is that one of the uh, spells that they want us under is I think that we just keep working harder and harder on the internet and da 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 And at some point, we have to unplug and understand there's a reason why those websites come up, like Steemit and others, perhaps BitChute. I haven't looked into it because I'm not drawn to it. For a reason, I'm not drawn to these alternative sites that want my energy. Oh, they're happy to take my content. They're happy to tell people that I haven't been involved in this for years and years and years that they're, they're, they're an alternative. And then some people can use them as an alternative if their audience is big enough or if we're able to build an audience. You know, but right now, the hive mind is, is going in some strange circles, whether it's in uh, one form of crypto crack or the other, or cyber crack would be another way to put it. And so for myself... You know, it was one step to go reporting from off the grid with the internet to, right, reporting from off the grid, discussing things without having the internet here. And I see value in both. And I think that there's going to be a time where I'm going to have the internet back on the property, but I'd like to be making more income to where $67 is basically not a big deal. You know, so the next few uh, months, next few months, there's going to be a lot of focused effort. It's going to be a lot of information. It's going to be a lot of things posted on the other websites as well, outside the box.vhx.tv. If you can join for $5.95 per month, well, I'd sure like to see you over there in the forum. We've got a couple dozen people uh, that have signed up. But if more of you could subscribe to something that's an alternative to YouTube that gives something back to the content creator, that's one website that I'd like to recommend next to pitching in over at patreon.com. And there's a number of exclusive podcasts that are only at Patreon. I've even considered, I've even considered, believe it or not, that's right, my own radio show. That's right. Alex Ansari's love song pitch from the 1970s and 80s. I want to rock with you. That's right. We'll, we'll try to edit out any karaoke moments that may occur. But yes, 
if you guys want to start showing your support and interest in content, making requests, you know, of course, content that fits within the niche of things that I already am comfortable talking about, enjoy talking about, can elaborate on. I don't necessarily get into um, conspiracy pop culture. What's in the top 100 billboard charts at rinse.com or infowars.com? Well, those people find me and they think, baby, I'm in the club and I'm, I'm talking like the parrots are, you know, because they hear, you know, some buzzwords like, you know, off the grid or new world order or something to that effect. And, you know, they're, they're expecting to hear the parroting and some of them may even stick around for a few months or a few years. Pressuring, you know, come on, Alex, join the parroting, join the talking points that come straight from Fox News and Infowars.com, you know, but I won't do it. Democrats are pretty quiet. I don't know, maybe they enjoy nature more. What are they, what are they called? Snowflake libtards? They must be out camping because they, they certainly can't be seen trolling. Anyways, uh, stepping back from the internet addiction and getting closer to nature to be continued.